So, uh, first I would like to say a few words about me and my research before starting uh, the talk. I would like uh, to explain, if, even if, uh, if I should, yeah, never mind, I have lived <coughs> on Reunion Island for 30 years, but I'm from Brittany, which is in a region in the northwest of France, where originally people spoke Breton only. And fortunately I don't, but my grandfather did, and he was compelled to learn French at school when he was nine years old. Mm -hmm. So owing to the language peculiarity of my region, I was convinced I was not French until I left Brittany at the age of nine. So when the teacher asked who is not French, I put up my hand, which made her laugh. Her reaction pretty much hurt my feeling because I felt I was different and I was quite proud of my Celtic roots. This is why I guess I was attracted to Irish studies when I had to specialize as an English student. For my MA, I chose to write on James Stevens, whose proficiency in the Gaelic language made him a master of the Irish uh, oral tradition. Together with John O'Mahony, living in America, he created the Irish uh, Republican Brotherhood, an Irish secret society, he found it simultaneously in Ireland and the USA in the 1850s. That movement, also called the Fenian Brotherhood, was influential in the Irish Revolution, culminating with the Easter Rising of 1916. It made sense to me to focus my PhD on Irish cultural nationalism, which I did with the Gaelic League, an association aiming at promoting the use of Irish of the Irish language in everyday life, thus shaping Irish identity and liberating Ireland from British imperialism. I studied that subject with a passion, focusing on the relationship between culture and politics, which was at the core of my study. Therefore, when I stumbled on murals from Belfast, mm -hmm. I was struck by the so-called culture from the north of Ireland and the tension surrounding orange marches. What is more, in July 2007, I read in a press article that the photograph of a young 16-year-old Catholic who died of a stroke in that year had been put on a bonfire. After removing the sign, the sign his father received death threats and had to leave his house. I felt the need to understand the reason for, for so much hatred almost 10 years after the peace agreement. Mm. So I have spent all my summers in Northern Ireland since that year, meeting residents from both communities, including uh, people erecting bonfires, at least when they agree to exchange with me. So the aim of this talk is to examine the part played by visual displays, political displays in Northern Ireland, sometimes coalescing around orange marches, you can see one here, particularly during the 12th of July. I will especially focus on those massive uh, structures um, um, which are uh, erected in July and they remain overtly a uh, sectarian, even if they belong to a very old uh, Protestant tradition. Bonfires are paradoxically higher and more frightening than before the peace process of 1998. It is an issue that has particularly been a tricky and contentious subject in recent years, cre frequently creating weeks of tension each summer. After considering the background, parading in Northern Ireland, the tradition of bonfires in England, I'll examine the process of their erection and study how the festivity evolved in recent years following changes occurring in Northern Ireland during the last decade. So parading is very common in Northern Ireland. It is a tradition which is firmly rooted in the Protestant community. The so-called marching season lasts from about April until September. There are nearly 4,000 parades in Northern Ireland every year. Although some are Republican parades, the vast bulk are Unionist. So in a Northern Ireland context, the term Republican is taken simply to imply that the person gives tacit or actual support to the use of physical force 
by paramilitary groups with Republican aims. And uh, unionists are in favor of uh, the union with Great Britain. So parade, parades account for the obsessive presence of Union Jacks, which can be seen everywhere in unionist areas. And depending on the local demography, on main roads, in towns and villages, especially during the summer. Painting murals is also part of this annual performance. So the reason for marching is to recall the Protestant ascendancy and the defeat of the Catholic James II during the Glorious Revolution. Parades are noisy, time and energy consuming events. They assert a Protestant prominence in a country which can be regarded as the first British colony. The Tudors played a significant part in that respect. Henry VIII proclaimed himself King of Ireland in 1541. Previously, English monarchs from 1172 had only styled themselves as Lord of Ireland. His daughter Elizabeth completed the conquest. A politics of settlement was implemented so that at the beginning of the 17th century, the whole country was colonized. The native population was uprooted and replaced with loyal Protestants from Scotland, England and Wales. Other parts of Ireland were also settled, but none so thoroughly and successfully as Ulster in the north of Ireland. A coherent Protestant population was established there. It is thus not surprising that the celebration of, of what is called the Twelfth took such a major role in that small part of the United Kingdom as it celebrates the victory of William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland in July 1690. Moreover, when the country was partitioned in 1921, the borders of Ulster were drawn to ensure a Protestant majority of two-thirds within the area so that six out of the nine counties of Ulster were to be separated from the south. It would be a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people, to quote James Craig, the first Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, and it created what Bill Ralston aptly called to inward-looking communities. And that in a country where the question of territory would be extremely sensitive. Therefore, that province was forged along sectarian lines since the plantations of the early 19th century. The Orange Order, which came into being in 1794-95, was formed to celebrate the symbolical victory. The first murals, which appeared um, by 1908, aimed at marking the territory in a more permanent way. These paintings show the importance of visual displays designed to assert Protestant identity. The erection of bonfires became, as early as spring, the more visible sign that the 12th was approaching. So celebrations and commemorations of people and events, including bonfires, were actually central to the ritual life of uh, 18th century England, as David Cressy and Elias. England was by no means the only home of bonfires and bells. Yet, distinctively in that part of the world, they were harnessed to the needs of the state to be deployed at its significant moments and anniversaries, so they would be associated with patriotism. Bonfires served two purposes. One was military, but the other had political overtones. They especially played a prominent part in Elizabethan England. Bonfires and bells celebrated the safety of Queen Elizabeth and her religion, when a Catholic conspiracy came undone in 1586. Their aim was thus to express joy and also warning. 
the gunpowder plot of 1605, which was synonymous with tree tree of the worst kind, marked a turning point in the history of England. Bonfires erected for that opportunity aimed at exacerbating feelings of <coughs> danger and triumph over evil. Therefore, celebrating the 5th of November, bore we'll witness to an obligation of memory which also called for watchfulness. The political function of bonfires is glaring even if they evolved with time. The burning of Guy Fawkes shows to what degree um, symbolism was paramount in such festivities. Therefore, we can also posit they had social values as well. They acted as a unifying force to single out the enemies of the state. Bonfires also had a military function. In 1690, they were lit to guide King William on his way to the Boyne. Thus, in Northern Ireland today, they not only commemorate the Battle of, uh, of the Boyne on the 12th of July, but they also serve to remind the Catholics that they lost the battle and to let them know they are still unwanted, sometimes in a very hostile way. So, um, the erecting of uh, bonfires has become a very organized occupation and the whole population is invited to take part in it. Children's bonfires are made too. The day before the 12th, they are set alight earlier to entertain children at 8 o'clock in the evening. As can be seen, they are made of a variety of materials. To that end, people are invited to dump wood at the site as early as in spring. Similar chaotic structures of bonfires are usual, yet Contrary to the bonfires which can be built with rubbish, <coughs> others are a lot more elaborate. They can show ingenuity in the making and be reminiscent of towers made with rocks. There are not many effigies on that bonfire. It could be considered military in style, despite the couple of flags flying at the top which are ready to be burnt. Before the peace process of 1998, so during the so-called troubles, bonfires were not so high and they did not look so blatantly sectarian. After the Good Friday Agreement, and especially from 2012, they changed dramatically as we'll see. From then on, they tended to be higher so that Bonfires are a lot, are even more indicative of institutionalized sectarianism through the prism of culture. So, what about the making of bonfires as early as spring? Pallets are bought and tires are collected too. Some bonfires can be massive, expensive, and attract children as well as young people. They are time and money and energy consuming. There is much craftsmanship and technicality about them. They are a matter of pride for those who erect them. It is an activity involving masculinity, shows of strength, and playing with fire, which has an important role in the whole process. Children and young people spend months on bonfire sites to collect wood, erect bonfires, and watch the wood will not be stolen. It means bonfires erecting is not a short-lived event. There is no controlling what happens on bonfire sites. For example, that one. Uh, that one was uh, built in 2015 there was absolutely no way of preventing its erection and setting on fire. We do what we want was the answer to the question I asked the young people for, about the reason for erecting it so close to houses. That area 
situated in East Belfast had to be evacuated mm -hmm. because it obviously put people's lives at risk. Bonfires are very much associated with power and control. Their erecting, which is a show of strength, can be seen as some kind of military occupation of land. The pride and will to show a relation of domination and superiority is striking. There's, there's also much defiance about them. To go, together with the manly aspect of the erection of bonfires, they entertain nostalgia for the past linked to the imperialistic history of Britain. The tension preceding the erection of bonfires can be felt as early as spring. Gathering wood and building shelters to watch it won't be stolen is to many young men from the loyalist community what they live for for the whole year. Even if the area looks actually uh, dirty and disorganized, it's like a theatre scene where everyone has a role to play. The point is to regain the territory supposedly won, previously uh, occupied by the vanquished, the Catholics, and we affirm that loyalists will not surrender. The Irish flag the, is often seen on bonfires. The Union Jack marks space uh, and uh, delimits bonfire zones where children and young people spend all their time for months. Sometimes Israeli flags can also be seen along with Union Jacks mm. as well as US Confederate mm. flags which provide an interesting example of ingenuity uh, loyalist acronyms being added to them. So once the bonfire is erected, the placing of effigies is another challenge, as bonfires are sometimes very high. Republicans and Sinn Féin politicians are usual targets, especially Jerry Adams, you can see here, and Jerry Kelly, who both played an important part in the Good Friday Agreement talks. So Sinn Féin, um, because you'll see posters of uh, Sinn Féin, it's uh, considered to be the political wing of uh, the Irish Republican Army. So posters of candidates from Sinn Féin can be found in the <coughs> number. Members of uh, IRA and INLA, so IRA, Irish Republican Army. INLA, Irish National Liberation Army, are also very often selected. In particular, the Hanger Strikers of 1981, a depiction of a Republican being crucified, can sometimes be seen making the bonfire a frightening sight. Photographs of Bobby Sands, you can see here, are especially provocative. He was the first member of the IRA to die during the hunger strike, strike of 1981, and he is the iconic figure of the Republican movement in Northern Ireland. So images of Bobby Sands are regularly burned on bonfires every year. Because at the end of the day, the motto is a call to murder Catholics, all of them. Placards carry the letter K A T T T being take a derogatory name for a Catholic. So it means kill all Catholics. Mm -hmm. The acronym mm -hmm. can be seen widely in Belfast, including close to children's playgrounds mm -hmm. where many bonfires are erected. So that bonfires are really part of the urban and country landscapes. For month. In a photograph uh, taken in 2010, we can see two children busy collecting whatever they can find to throw at a puppet wearing a Celtic football um, uh, team top. So Celtic is a Scottish uh, football team supported widely by Catholics in Scotland and Ireland. 
So the rejection of one group seems to be at stake as sport tops stand for the Catholic community. And Gaelic sports are representative of that community's identity. So it's no longer the Pope or Guy Fawkes, but an ethnic group uh, uh, is targeted as a whole, an ethnic group as a whole. So young people and children take part directly in bonfire activities and they just reproduce what they see quite often in a more open way than adults. They may show obscenity towards effigies and the Irish flag. This seems to entertain a sense of superiority, sometimes hatred, which is fully expressed when the Irish flag in particular is burned at midnight on the 11th of uh, July. So at that specific time, I'll show you a, a footage, at that specific time, a big cheer rises from the crowd. <coughs> at the top of the bonfire has burned, loud music is played. Young people start dancing and families with young children leave. Wild behavior and alcohol replace the gathering of the community obviously reinforced by the ritual. Barbret Ehrenreich analyzes how music and dance equally keep people together. <coughs> and this dates back to the tradition of carnival. But contrary to carnival, where the powerful are mocked, an enemy is here targeted and symbolically alienated. Its destruction acts as an expression of sociability, <coughs> uniting a community. So environmentally speaking, bonfires are highly objectionable as well. Tires are regularly burned, even if this is illegal. Moreover, they are extremely dangerous. Every year, firemen are called to put out dangerous bonfires, <coughs> which sometimes devastate houses, um, so that people living close to them try and leave their district for a few days. Three years ago, three houses were partially burned in Belfast. It can be a destructive culture, which seems to be an outlet for frustration and a fear of having to share a land which they see as being for one community only. So the following day, on the 12th of July, military style marches accompanied by music complete the conquest by parading along designated routes cheered by whole families gathered to see them. The orange marches following the burning of bonfires don't offer just a limited experience, like the nationalist ones from Germany or Italy uh, in the uh, 20th century, as Barbara Ehrenreich points out. They are participatory events where children are happy to mimic bandsmen, and everyone indulges in cheering, drinking, and sometimes wild behavior. So the participation of children and teenagers in those festivities can be regarded as the most disturbing aspect of bonfires because of the very visual environment they um, must be used to for weeks every year. And yet, officially, bonfires belong to culture. In spite of their contentious and dangerous aspects, community receive grants which are supposed to encourage creativity. So who gives funding? So this is public money. 
So to quote uh, Belfast City Council this year, one of the goals of our Good Relations Action Plan is to promote the positive expression of culture. As part of this, we are working with communities across Belfast to help improve the way July bonfires are managed and provide support to increase opportunities for positive cultural expression. So why? Why is that? The Good Friday Agreement aimed at enabling communities to celebrate their own culture in order to favor peace. That's a Good Friday uh, Agreement. Hence, the funding which is given to erect bonfires. Bill Ralston and Robbie McVie indicate how the new state was thus, I quote, a reworking rather than a transcending of sectarianism. And they add, the state engendered not so much a society free from sectarianism as one in which sectarianism is institutionalized in new forms, end quote. Yeah. Bonfires are constantly referred to by loyalist, loyalists as mere expression of Protestant culture, in spite of their obvious political nature. Yet it would be wrong to believe that the Protestant community is united and that bonfires are well accepted by all unionists. However, for a long time, there has been impunity about what loyalists did in their community, including their misbehavior towards nationalist Catholics, as Bill Rolston and Robbie McVeigh analyze. I quote, whether it was painting murals, marching, intimidating nationalists, nationalist Catholics, out of loyalist workplaces or residential areas, or organizing <coughs> defense groups, loyalists saw these practices as not only their right, but as a vital part of maintaining the state. So, end quote. So having to renounce what they deem justified in the name of equality was bound to be difficult to accept. As Bill Rolston demonstrates, the agreement created a degree of loyalist alienation. The political gains of republicanism were not matched by loyalist political parties. Whatever the reality, there was an undoubted perception that loyalists had been sold out by the government. And this is what accounts for the culture before cash poster, which can be seen on some bonfires. Some groups now refuse to accept grants because they do not want to accept the rules they need to abide by if they get funding. So the power struggle which characterizes activities around bonfires has been reinforced by the Good Friday Agreement, the Peace Agreement. So loyalism has often been defined simply as a physical force unionism that was primarily situated in a working class area. So more complete definitions have included loyalist paramilitaries. So the two main paramilitary uh, loyalist uh, movements control bonfire areas in Northern Ireland. So Desmond Bell argues that what is being enacted in the streets of Belfast and Derry <coughs> is I quote nationalism of the neighborhood, as the Protestant imagined community is not a nation. It remains, he posits, I quote, what is always has been, a beleaguered garrison loyal to crown and empire, defending an imperial interest in a hostile and rebellious land, loyal to a sovereign who can guarantee their liberties and ascendancy, end quote. So that identity is dependent on the rehearsed myth, ritualized practices, and confrontation of the marching season. Since the 1960s, young people have developed their own sense of ethnic identity in a situation of political confrontation. 
the loss of land and control experienced by, experienced by the Protestant working class account for the rise in sectarianism and violence around bonfires. So we have seen that bonfires have a double purpose in Northern Ireland. They entertain a military function of conquest and domination, which account for the impressive height of bonfires visible from Catholic areas, and they display as much animosity as possible towards perceived enemies. So with time, uh, effigies have tended to be more numerous. Catholic values. The Virgin Mary could be seen in 2016 and 27, and international iconic revolutionary figures or symbols and flags are burnt together with the Irish flag. The Palestinian flag can regularly be spotted. Che Guevara, a traditional figure of Republican representation and support, could also be seen at the top of a bonfire in North Belfast in 2015. What was quite new in that year was the flag of the Islamic State. Which can be interpreted as a fear of the foreigner. So ISIS was thus another enemy to destroy. Mm. And even if that group has nothing to do with Northern Ireland, it was it was targeted simply it does not belong to the unionist community. So since 2013, bonfires have tended to become the privileged medium to show the lack of confidence in politicians. Obviously, bonfires now enable the common people to express their resentment against their own leaders. That photograph of a bonfire dating back to 2014 is very instructive in this regard. No one represents us was stuck on a poster on it. It shows that the political body as a whole was rejected. So the danger was no longer felt coming from Sinn Féin only. It obviously originated from within, from Protestant politicians unable to cope with people's frustrations. Interestingly, the equation between the unionist community and the Israeli people was claimed on the same bonfire, which accounted for the latter's right to self-defense. The same is true of the Confederate flag, which can be seen more often than before, especially in certain areas in East Belfast. So 2014 followed a year of great tension. Numerous and bigger Union Jacks could be seen everywhere throughout the North. It was the first year when the Orange Parade had not been allowed to march in the Republican area of Ardoin in Belfast. So that march was a very contentious one, giving rise to many tensions, like here, I mm -hmm. took those pictures mm -hmm. in 2010. So, so as you can see, the parade has to be protected. Um, so whenever a parade is denied the right to march in a Catholic nationalist area, it marks a loss of land, so it is symbolically traumatizing for the part of uh, the loyalist uh, unionist community. What is more, at the end of 2012, the Union Jack was almost permanently removed from the city hall of Belfast in December, uh, which gave rise to numerous protests and riots for the whole year. A hundred years after the Ulster Covenant against the project of Home Rule in Ireland, where the biggest Union Jack ever was made in Belfast, the decision was very difficult to accept. Numerous protests and trouble followed. Those demonstrations bear witness to the feelings of concern experienced by the community erecting bonfires. Irish flags ready to be burned were bigger. Mm. Effigies of politicians su supposed to be 
on the nationalist side were burned and depictions of hangings were displayed. On a few bonfires, a picture member of the Alliance Party, a moderate unionist party which advocates improving cross-community relations, was burned mm. alongside a picture of the leader of Sinn Féin. Mm. Animosity toward prominent members of the Republican movement was even more blatant and calls to crucify all Catholics could be seen in a capital city of uh, northern Belfast, including in bonfire zones. A puppet representing Jerry Adams being hanged could be seen in places. At the same period, the, the results of the population census were revealed. That census was a shock, as it showed the proportion of Catholics under the age of uh, 18 was now greater than the population, the Protestant population, so it can be considered a turning point in the history of Northern Ireland. So we can see here that bonfires act as outlets for the fears of a community apparently concerned for its very existence. It is pathetic to note that in doing so, that community is endangering its very members like in 2016, when three houses were partially destroyed by a bonfire. The lack of reflection by the inhabitants of the area following the incident was puzzling and distressing. In recent years, following the incidents we mentioned, the impunity pervading such festivities has started to be more criticized and the tradition questioned. The celebration of the centenary of the Irish Revolution um, three years ago caused tension among loyalists. It accounted for the following mural painted close to a bonfire, better to die rather than live in an Irish Republic. The following year, bonfire collection started six months ahead of 11th night and 26, 18, 20, 18, sorry, marked a turning point in the history of the 12th. Two dangerous bonfires situated in East Belfast were removed by masked workers under police protection following judicial decisions. In the same year, another bonfire in East Belfast was set alight hours after a court ordered its height to be reduced ahead of the 11th night. That decision was considered to have been a very significant, a significant event in that year's 12th <coughs> celebration. The intervention of the judicial reveals a decisive step which should be followed by further shows of strength. The tricky question of Brexit which loyalists are in favor of might even more complicate matters. So what can we say to conclude? So we have seen that the context in which sectarianism could keep on flourishing had been created by the Good Friday, the peace agreement, the 1998 Good Friday agreement. We could wonder to what extent a satisfactory peace agreement was simply possible in a country which was partitioned after centuries of occupation and disposition in a country in a context of crisis at the beginning of the 20th century but seen from another point of view we should consider the loyalist standpoint once a majority in a state which was created for one community only then becoming a mi minority and then and was then in a way condemned to share the territory with the 1998 peace agreement. We can eventually conclude that the persisting sectarianism from Northern Ireland can also find its roots in the partition of the island, which was fundamentally a bad agreement on the Irish problem. Thank you so much.